Hi, welcome to the Geeky Boomer podcast. I am Pixel Pia, your host. And in today's episode, I will take you on a journey in my early contact with computers and eventually with what was to become the internet and World Wide Web. So this story take place in Sweden during the 1990s. This story really starts back in 1988, the year I got my teacher's degree and also the year when I got my first assignment as a teacher. I got a job as a full-time substitute at one particular school. That meant that if a teacher was out, I filled in. And when all teachers were at work, I had like a shadow schedule where I came in as an extra resource in some classes. And I did some time helping teacher with copying material and things like that. I worked at this school a couple of years and... It was a pretty up with the time school. So we had computers for the teachers in our teacher's lunch. The big buzzword for education at this time was multimedia. This was early 90s. And a part of the multimedia resources was CDs, CD-ROM as we called them back then. And... Our computer in the teacher's workroom had an audio card. I think we had an IBM machine. I'm not 100% sure about that. Remember, it's 35 years ago, so it's hard to remember. But we didn't have a CD-ROM player. And for you geeks out there, let me read what a typical... IBM machine at this time contained. And this I have looked up online. It was, I think, Windows 2.0 or maybe 3, I'm not sure. It had a CPU that was either 8088 or 8086 processor. It had 640 kilobytes of RAM, of memory. It had a hard drive of around one megabyte. It had a VGA graphics card. And as I said, sound card, probably a sound blaster. The monitor was a 14 inch big bulky. I will put images for those of you who watch this on YouTube. So you can see big bulky, deep 14 inch monitor, a keyboard and a mouse. Multimedia was the buzzword, and I wanted us to have a CD player in this computer for the teachers. We could look at CD-ROMs. There were a lot of educational CD-ROM coming out at this point in time. So I talked to my principal, and she agreed we could invest in that. And I contacted the tech department which at this point for the school district was one person. So very quickly we got a CD-ROM sent to us and with that came a note that he wouldn't be able to come until four to six weeks later to install it. That's when I decided that I wanted to learn how to do this myself. If that had been today, I would have turned to YouTube and found an instructional video. But back then, we didn't have that opportunity. We didn't have the World Wide Web yet. So what I had to do was find either magazines, PC magazines, books, or VHS tapes to show me. I went to the library, and I managed to find a VHS tape about how to install a CD-ROM in a computer tower. They didn't have it at our library. They had to order it from another library, and that took a week or something like that. I borrowed that VHS tape, 
and went home and watched it over and over and over so many times. But I never got brave enough to put the screwdriver to my computer or to the school computer and try to install it, even though I have watched this tape so many times. But you can be sure that when the tech finally came to install it, I was there. And he had to show me exactly what he did. This was the first time I ever looked inside a computer. And to my surprise, it was much easier to do than I had expected. There were a couple of things that I hadn't picked up from the tape I watched about how to connect it to the sound card and things like that, but it really wasn't that complicated. And that's when I really decided that this is something I can learn. As a new teacher, I let that learning fall on the back burner because I had so much I wanted to learn about my teaching at this point. And it wasn't until late in the 90s that I really got interested in the inside of computers again. At this point in time, I had a boyfriend that was much more of a geek than I ever was or than I am now. And he put together his own computers. And with him by my side, I actually put together my first own computer. We bought the different parts, we bought an empty tower and so forth. And I built my own computer. But back to the early 90s. As I said, I worked at this school district a couple of years. Then I moved to a new school. This new school was very progressive when it came to technology. I worked as a teacher in an H-mixed class, grade 4, 5, and 6 mixed. And as I said, they were very progressive, and each classroom had at least one, if not two or three computers. What we had was Macintosh and See, and I will put a picture up here somewhere for those of you who don't know what that is. The specs for this computer is it had a CPU of 16 megahertz, two or four megabyte of ROM. I don't know how much memory we had in ours. It came either with a 40 or an 80 megabyte hard drive. A 256 kilobyte VRAM graphics card, and the display could show up to 512 by 384 pixels. And it was color, 8 bit color. It had built in speakers, it had a 14 inch monitor again, a keyboard, a mouse, a floppy disk, of course, and a built in Ethernet, which will be important for me later on. The original cost for Macintosh LC when they first came out was around $2,500. But development went fast and the prices quickly went lower. After a couple of years, I decided it was time for me to get a computer at home. This was probably mid-90s, somewhere, 94, 95, something like that. So I bought myself a Macintosh LC. The reason I bought that and not a newer computer was that I wanted to have the same computer at home as we had at work. And with that, with my first home computer, came this. Uh, 
And if you don't know what that sound was, it was modem, the dial-up modem connecting to the internet. That was how we connected back then. I had a US Robotics 14.4 kilobytes modem. They were usually called fax modem, and you could use them to send text files. I think I have a picture of a modem like that to show you. What you needed to connect was your modem, your computer, and a home phone line. The internet service providers, the ISP, used the phone line to connect to the internet. I believe I had Telia as my internet provider. That was my phone provider, and I think I went with the same company as my internet provider. Back then, there were a couple to choose from in Sweden. It cost me around $50 per month to be able to connect to the internet. This dial-up technology meant that back then, it was very unusual that someone had a mobile phone. So everybody had phone at home connected by phone lines. And the problem was that when you connected to the internet, no one could use the phone. And if you lift the receiver on the phone at home when someone is online, you just hear this scroggly knaster in the background, the sound of someone sending information back and forth. For me, I live by myself at this time, so it wasn't a problem, but I know many families where there were discussions on when you could go online and when you couldn't, because going online meant that the phone was blocked. And to give you some ideas of what you could do with a modem like this, if I was to send a regular photo that I had maybe scanned in to my computer, a four by six color photo, if I was to send that to someone, it would take around 18.5 minutes to send that. And to calculate this, I assumed a file size of two megabytes. If I was to send a short email, which usually was maybe five KB, kilobytes, it would take around three seconds. And if I was to send a Word document, text document of, let's say, five pages, it would probably take a little under a minute. So this was in no way fast. And that is why everything on the internet in the beginning was very much text-based. So now we are in the later half of the 90s, and you may ask, what could you do on the internet? Well, number one, and the reason so many people started using it was email, of course, which I used a lot. But at this time, we started to see what was to become the web, the www, worldwide web. And with that, web browsing became popular. People used web browsers like the very first one was, I think, Mozilla. But later on, we had Microsoft Internet Explorer, and we had Netscape Navigator. And Netscape Navigator has a whole story by itself, but that was probably at least in Sweden, the most popular web browser. The web, as I said, looked very different. And I will show a couple of websites from back in the days here. So you can see the web made a big difference in how people started to use the internet in many, many ways. But back then we also used instant messaging, AOL messaging, and my favorite from back in the days was ICQ. This was a little app you installed. 
you connected with your friends. You could see when they were online and you could send messages in real time back and forth. ICQ was my favorite, but as I said, AOL had their version called AIN. Another thing that became very popular was online forums and bulletin boards. Places where people came together that had the common interest or common problems or something that connected them. And this was discussion boards where you could ask questions, you could answer other people's questions. And for those of you who don't know what a bulletin board or a forum looked like, even though they are still common online, you can compare it maybe to Discord. And Discord was much later, 20 years later. Discord came in 20. 50. It is much more advanced than what the web forum was, but it has its similarities. Online gaming was something that started to show up back then, but back then it was mostly text-based multiplayer games. One of the more popular was called MUD, M-U-D, which stands for Multi-User Dungeons. I was never really into online gaming. Who could have thought that this would be the enormous industry it is today? In 2020, the online gaming market was valued to $162 billion. We have professional gamers that compete in esports. And we have platforms like Twitch or here on YouTube where all people do is gaming and they can make a living from it. Another function of the internet in the early stages and even today was, of course, file sharing. Thanks to another new protocol that was called FTP, what we use still today to send files between people. Online shopping actually started pretty early. And according to many sources, I can't swear on this, but according to very many sources, the first online shopping experience was a man named Phil Brandenburger, who bought a CD, a musical CD with Sting's album, Ten Summoner's Tales. I have seen that he bought it from an online retailer, but I have also seen that he bought it from someone he knew. They did the money transfer online, and the CD itself was then sent by mail. I don't know if this was the very first online shopping experience, but this is supposed to have happened in 94. And some people say this was the starting point for e-commerce. Something that quickly started was search engines. As the World Wide Web expanded, people needed a way to find the information they were looking for. The thing with the search engine was that they were indexed. They had a form of a catalog of different websites. And one of the first search engines was called Webcrawler. Another early indexed web search page was Aliweb. This worked a little different. If you wanted to show up on Aliweb, you had to go to Aliweb and submit your website to that search engine. While web crawler had a web crawler that crawled around the web and found websites and indexed them. Another phenomenon with a growing world wide web. Where is wild? No, world wide web, even though it was wild from time to time, was that people could create their own websites, personal websites. 
And I know early on, people wrote what we today would call blogs. A lot of people had online journals or diaries that they shared with other people. In the very beginning, I was quick on adapting to personal websites. So I learned HTML code, which was the early way of producing a website. It was just a text document written in HTML code. I remember it wasn't fast to send information up to the internet. So that was one of the reasons why we coded, for example, in a notepad. I early on also started to create graphics for websites. And when you look at some of these websites from the early days, they are not very dramatic graphics. It had to be small pieces. For example, to create a background, you made a little square. It could be as little as 10 by 10 pixels with a repeating pattern that you wrote your code that it would repeat. And that little piece of graphics created the whole background of your website. The growth of the World Wide Web also helped when it came to research on the internet. To research or gather information became so much easier than before the web. And today it's hard to think about the time when you couldn't go out and Google something. And I can't talk about the early days of the internet without talking about IRC which stands for Internet Relay Chat. This was programs that connected to a server and there were many different chat servers. We had Dollnet, IRCnet, and many, many others. Many of them placed in universities. And on those servers, there were different rooms, chat rooms, where you could connect with people that had similar interests or there were rooms for anything, political rooms, crafting rooms. There were a place for everybody. I personally spent a lot of time in chat rooms back then. And one of my fondest memory from the late nineties was when we were a group of people that often hang out together in the same chat room from all over Europe. And we decided that we would have a meetup. So we met up a weekend at a camping place outside of Copenhagen in Denmark. And I believe it was around 20 people that came from around Europe to this meetup. And many of those are people I have contact with still today. You have to remember it was very different times. This is more than 25 years ago. You didn't worry as much about trolls or people trying to cheat you in any way. There was, in the beginning of the internet, there was a different climate. We all agreed on a lot of things that is hard to explain today. We all followed what we call the netiquette, things that were accepted and not accepted online. And this was just an unwritten law that everybody followed. You would very rarely see someone right in a chat room with caps. They would probably be kicked out pretty quick. I wouldn't recommend anybody today to meet someone from the internet if you are not 100% sure who you are meeting and never do it alone. But as I said, back then, maybe this was 98, 99, I'm not sure. It was a different climate online. And I for sure miss a lot of the trust and the honesty that I found in people online 
in the 90s. Well, now we have reached the end of the 20th century, and with that, the end of this episode. I know I talked a lot about me and my experience today, but I hope you found some enjoyment. Maybe you had some aha moments. Maybe you have a story from the 90s in the internet that you would like to share. If so, I have a form for you to fill out on my website thegeekyboomer.com. You can use that to share a story. And in upcoming episodes, I will try and share some of your stories with my audience. You can also use the same form if you have suggestions or ideas about upcoming episodes, things you would like to talk about that fits within the Geeky Boomer. And on the same website, but with a different form, you can also sign up for my monthly newsletter, monthly within quotations. There will be occasional emails with updates on what is coming and what I had planned for the future. So if that is something you would like to get, please go over to my website, thegeekboomer.com and sign up for my newsletter. Until next time, bye.